All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Monica McCubrey, and this is the Science of Animal Communication today. So uh, in our summer series, we have this one and then one more next week, and then we don't have any more until early October, I believe, or late September. I can't remember when exactly we start, but um, so it's going to be a little bit here, but um, today we're talking about animal communication. So like I mentioned a little bit ago, this is going to be the ways that animals communicate with each other, what they're saying to to each other and how it exactly works. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with everybody. Like we also have a lot to get through today. So um, it might be a little bit longer than usually some of them, but it will still be under an hour. I will keep it under an hour for all of you. So, okay, we'll get started. All right. All right, so my name is Monica, like I mentioned, and today this is the science of communication. Um, so if you've been on here before, you kind of know the drill, but um, I hope that you ask questions. I hope that you have comments. Um, if you do, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, there are some breaks in between the different sections so we can stop and look at questions. If we don't get a chance to, if we're kind of running behind, we always do have a question answer session at the very end. Um, so please ask questions. If for some reason I cannot answer them, I will find someone that can. So we will do our best to do that, but just make sure that when and you are putting stuff in the chat that we're relating to the topic on hand and that we are being kind to everyone that's on today. All right. I also want to point out that I am by no means an animal expert. I am a very good talker and I talk a lot, but that does not mean that I know everything about animal communication. Um, I did a lot of research for this today, um, so we will do our best at answering those questions like I mentioned. But if you have questions or comments that I'm just unsure of or I don't want to give you the wrong answer, I'm going to say I don't know, but I will find someone that can answer those questions for you. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about uh, communication basics. So how do you communicate? Why do animals communicate? We're going to cover all those bases today. And then basically what we're going to go through is the different types. Um, we call them modalities or the way that animals communicate. And we're going to just show a few examples from each of those different categories um, just to show you how animals communicate with each other. Um, I will point out that this is probably one. Um, I do have some Nebraska examples on here. There are quite a few that are not from Nebraska as well. So just letting you know, I know that we have a lot of people that join us from out of state. So I tried to uh, cater that to some people that might not be here as well. But let's go ahead first and talk about who is communicating. So every organism, no matter what it is, has some form of communication. They have decisions that they have to make. They have messages that they need to send. And a lot of those cases, they benefit both players. So when we talk about players, we talk about um, a sender and a receiver. So there's always two ends to that communication. There's someone or something, that organism that is um, needing to say something or give a message to something else. And there's something that receives that message. And we'll talk a little bit more of that in depth here in a second. Um, but basically, in some cases, there's only um, one player that benefits from that uh, side of the communication. So maybe there's a miscommunication, or maybe the animal doesn't understand what they're trying to say, or maybe it's between different types of species. Um, but either way, when you do that, there's always a sender and a receiver. And when we talk about communication that happens at different levels, there's communication between predator and prey. There's communication between um, mama and chicks. There's communication between um, mating, different types of mating, or maybe between an individual to a larger group. Um, so there's lots of different ways and groups and types of communication. And like I mentioned earlier, different levels of communication. All right, so what do you necessarily need for effective communication or what exactly is communication? So when we break it down, it's classified as when the action of or a cue given by one organism, which we know as the um, sender, so that's sending that message, it's perceived then and it alters the probability pattern or the behavior of another organism, which then is the receiver. So I send a message out and then someone has to receive that information. So um, 
the ability to communicate effectively, as people know, is highly important, um, but it's also very important for animals as well. There's a lot that they need to say, that there's a lot that they need to communicate, and so being able to communicate effectively is um, sometimes this di division between life and death, or maybe between getting a mate and not getting a mate, or being eaten and being the predator. So there's a lot of different ways that animals communicate with each other. They face daily decisions on how they need to behave. Um, for instance, like a sea anemone needs to decide when to expand their tentacles, or a male lion maybe needs to approach another male lion that may be reluctant and they need to communicate with each other. Um, so when we really break it down, whenever we see animals doing something, there's some form of communication. Even if people do not understand what they're trying to communicate, they don't really care. They're still trying to live their life and they're still trying to communicate between their family group or their mom and chicks or their mating. Um, so it's very important for them to effectively communicate those signals. Um, also, it kind of depends um, when the sender is sending out those or receiving those information. Um, the information that they receive is not just, I got your message, but I have to make a decision based on what you're communicating to me. So um, through evolution and through multiple generations, there's that alternative outcomes of choice. So it's really decided upon um, the conditions of the environment, um, the conditions and the health of the individual receiving that information, um, different types of sensory com, um, information, and it's also could be reflexive or it could be conscious. So it's, it's guided by those evolutionary bias when we talk about them. Um, based on those alternative outcomes of choice. Um, so the recent experience, um, for instance, if I'm an animal and I recently ate something that did not taste good, I know that I probably won't eat something that looks like that again, or I'm not going to waste my time and my energy eating something that I know is toxic or I knew that tastes really bad. So um, other animals can communicate that to me um, and I can make that choice based on me and my environment as well. All right, so back to that sender receiver. So there's always a sender and there's always a receiver. Um, the receiver uses the signal information to help make a decision. So once that information has been put out there, that receiver then receives it, they grab that information, um, and then they make a decision based on that. So this is something that obviously happens very quickly a lot of times. Sometimes it happens a little bit more slowly. It just kind of depends on what that information is being put out there. So um, an animal that provides the signal we know is the sender and that animal that receives the signal or the signal is directed at is known as the receiver. Um, so the receiver then, for instance, let's say there's two elk, um, the receiver must decide if they would like to fight each other or if they're going to flee from their opponent. Um, so it brings that decision bias. Um, so again, if they're an animal that has been prone to losing in fights quite frequently. If that sender is like, okay, I'm here, this is my territory, that receiver then either needs to decide I'm going to go flee or I'm going to try and fight this animal. Um, but again, based on those decisions and those likely things that have happened, that is the animal that then makes that decision. So it could play a role in kind of shaping the evaluation of that situation. All right, so how do animals communicate? Well, there's a variety of ways they do that. There's a bunch of sensory channels um, or signal modalities is what we call them um, and how they communicate with each other. So these are the ones that we're going to talk about today. Um, there's visual. Uh, these are very easy and kind of a display. Um, and basically they are for animals. They're very effective for animals that are active during the day. So these are animals that have good eyesight. They're out during the day because if you are nocturnal, visual display is not really going to work because it's dark. And then you also have an acoustic signal, or sometimes people call it an auditory signal or communication. So this is the sound. So it's exceedingly abundant, abundant in nature. Um, we hear lots of different types of animals making noises, but what are they saying? Um, and then chemical signals. So this travels um, a little bit more slowly through the environment, but when we talk about things like pheromones or smells. This is going to be one of those that we'll mention or, or a little bit later today. And then we also have tactile signals. So this is touch. Um, this is very prudent in the animal world. Um, physical contact, especially between like the sender and the receiver, especially during mating seasons, um, between mom and babies. So this is very important as well. And then electrical signals. So um, these are mostly for aquatic animals that live in kind of murky environments. A lot of them have those kind of signals that um, they can sense that something's in the water. For instance, like a fish, their lateral line, um, it's a line that runs down 
um, fish, it has a little bit of an electrical signal and they can kind of sense where they're going. So um, those are the ones that we're going to be talking about today. All right, so that was like a very basic info um, of what they're doing, why they communicate, who communicates, the sender and the receiver. So kind of just remember that as we go through these today. So I'm going to go ahead and talk, start with the visual communication. I am a very visual person, um, so we're going to talk about visual to start with. Um, so if you remember, these are for animals that are, um, it's most effective for animals that are active during the daytime. So these are going to be diurnal animals possibly some crepuscular, which is active at dawn and dusk animals, um, but mostly for those diurnal animals. Uh, so this could be anything, some type of visual display. It could be coloration. It could be a pattern on the animal. It could be body movements. They're all part of that visual um, kind of uh, grouping or category. So this is very similar to people in body language. So they don't have to say anything, but you can tell a lot about a person by the way they're holding their body. Do they have their arms crossed? Are they slouching? Um, are they um, looking you in the eye? So there's a lot of different ways to understand what people are saying and communicate just by looking at them. Um, a lot of animals in the world, they have a lot of vibrant colors. Sometimes they have contrasting colors that often signals that the animal is toxic or poisonous or venomous. Um, we see this a lot uh, for like instance in cats. If you've ever seen a cat that arch its back before. That's a visual display. Um, animals uh, will communicate all sorts of ways through how they look. Um, and it can be something called a structural adaptation. Um, we call that sometimes a badge, or it could be a behavioral adaptation, like a display. And for instance, like a bird of paradise. So there's displays, and then there's something called a badge, which is just like a structural adaptation on the animal physically. All right, so um, sometimes they're very obvious, sometimes they are not. We see it in lots of different types of insects. We see it in snakes, wasps, um, marine animals. So it kind of just depends. There's basically any animal you could see this. There's a lot of danger messages. So they warn off, for instance, hungry predators or other inquisitive animals that may want to um, investigate on them. There's a lot of visual cues to identify um, family group members. Um, within those family groups, there's a lot of visual markings. We'll talk a little bit about some types of wasps that have different types of facial structures and different types of facial markings, and they can understand the hierarchy of their environment and their colony based on those markings on their face. Um, but this could be a gesture, a posture, facial expression, coloration, and then some types of communication, they might be super obvious to um, us. They could be super obvious to an animal. Sometimes they're not so obvious. So something like luring in a prey, um, for instance, like an anglerfish. Everyone knows those from like Finding Nemo, the ones with the bioluminescent light on it. Um, it lures those animals in. That's a visual display or camouflaging. Maybe they don't want to know that animals are there. They don't want other animals to know they're around um, or even mimicking other types of animals or looking like something else. Um, so they can be passive. It's a little bit more passive than the other types of uh, uh, communication that we will talk about today, um, but they communicate many different messages. They can do them at the same time, um, and it's interpreted differently by different types of animals. All right, birds are a really good example of visual displays. Peacocks, for instance, um, a lot of animals, especially birds, they're brightly colored for mating reasons. Um, they're normally a combination of behaviors too. So when we think about um, the types of behaviors that we're gonna talk about today, it's not usually just one different way. For instance, birds, they're gonna do a lot of auditory, so they're gonna make a lot of sounds, but some birds also make a lot of um, visual display. So double types of communication. Sometimes you use four or five different types of communication. So it's not usually just one animal doing one certain way. Um, so think about that too, as we talk about this, you will, I think you'll see bees in like three different categories today. So there's lots of different ways that animals communicate. All right, so colorful birds are a huge thing. Um, feathers, different types of feathers, they're very subtle sometimes in that communication. Males usually have bright, bold colors. They have those bright plumages. Um, basically, 
indicating to a female how healthy and strong that that male is. Um, usually the brighter the color, um, the healthier the male. Um, the females would really like that when it comes to female choice um, in a mate because she knows that she's going to have good, the male is going to have good genes. He's going to be able to pass on those and make um, healthy, strong, uh, young. So um, basically that's what a female is looking for when she sees sometimes those bright colors. Um, birds of paradise, they have a lot of those cool displays as well. Well, if you, uh, there's a lot of different types of birds of paradise. I'm kind of just grouping those in together. Um, they have the really long tail feathers. Sometimes they have crowns on their head. They do these really cool kind of dance moves. There's some like the mannequin bird will moonwalk on the um, branches. It looks like they're moonwalking on the branches. Um, there's some that will imitate other different types. So it's not necessarily just the colorful feathers. Sometimes it's something else that goes with them. Uh, Cardinals, they have a very pretty song, um, but also the brighter the male bird, the more likely then he is to get a female because she knows how strong and um, healthy the male looks. Um, so healthy animals usually make um, better mates than the weaker ones, and then the offspring then will be better, stronger, and able to survive. All right, so one example, which we do not have in Nebraska, I'm sure a lot of people have heard about this one. Um, this is like a warning display. Um, so it's called the aposematism. So these are animals with really bright colors as a warning to other predators. So this is something called a blue ringed octopus. Again, we do not have these in Nebraska, um, but they're found in the Pacific and the Indian Oceans. Um, they live on coral reefs and they're really kind of rocky areas of the seafloor. Um, they're very, venomous. So when they bite, they have a very powerful toxin. Um, it is usually, they say it's about strong enough to kill about 26 people um, with one bite very quickly. Um, so they have a lot of um, warning to let other predators know, don't mess with me. And how do they communicate that? Well, it's through their brightly colored skin. So when you see this octopus, that's why it's called the blue ringed octopus. Um, they carry enough venom, like I mentioned, to um, do some damage, um, but they're only a threat when they feel threatened and they, and they directly bite somebody. But they have these really cool chromatophores in their skin, um, under their skin that allow them to change color almost instantaneously. So again, those vivid colors are a warning. Do not mess with me. If you've ever heard of like poison dart frogs or poison arrow frogs, it's the same concept. The brighter the colors usually means a warning um, that they're toxic or they taste bad or something like that. So this is one of those, the blue ring octopus. All right, earlier I mentioned there were wasps that had certain facial markings um, that were unique. So this is a way for them to communicate the hierarchy within their colony. So some wasps have these unique facial markings that differ from colony to colony. So if a stranger would come into their colony, they would know right away that they're an intruder because of their types of facial markings. Um, and this was extremely variable when you looked at their, they're called the cuticle, um, cuticle markings on the face and also sometimes the abdomen. Um, but basically it helps to identify queens and worker nest mates as individuals. Um, so they can communicate and understand who's already um, been the queen, who's beaten a queen. So they have a higher ranking in the hierarchy and it kind of helps just keep the peace within that colony. Um, they can remember other individuals. I found some studies that mentioned um, of the same species for at least a week. Um, we have paper wasps, types of paper wasps in Nebraska. Um, they can discriminate between individual faces of their own species, but not that of other species. Um, and they do this all through processing of their compound eyes. So if you look closely at this image here, you can see all the compound eyes, the little tiny eyes within the eyes. Um, that's how they know they visually communicate that to other uh, types of wasps. All right, wolves are another big example. Um, we've been hearing some wolves and stuff that have come into Nebraska. We've been seeing they were here historically. They were eliminated at one point. They're starting to come back. We've had a few reports of wolves. Um, so wolf displays are a very big visual cue. Um, I'm sure all of you that have dogs, if you have more than one dog, you have a, a dominant dog and you have a submissive dog. Um, so when you think about this, wolves use that body language to convey the rules of the pack and their packs are very organized. So um, usually when we we talk about a pack of wolves. It is made up of leaders and followers, and the pack leaders are going to be the male parent and the female parent, which is usually the mother and the father of those pack members. 
Um, it's usually known as the dominant pair. Um, they're usually the only members that produce pups. And then any wolf can become dominant, but it does have to find an unoccupied territory and find a member of the opposite sex to mate with. And then they would have to communicate that dominance. Um, so they carry their tails high and they stand tall. That is a way for other animals to know that I am the dominant one. This is my territory. If you would like to mess with me, fine, but um, I'm just letting you know I'm dominant in this area. Um, less dominant wolves will exhibit a submissive type of behavior. They hold their tails down. They often lower their bodies. They paw at the ground. Um, if you ever have a dog, um, I have a huge like 70 pound lab and she it just will lay down and like show her belly. Um, she's definitely not the dominant one. Um, so <laughs> I totally know these um, uh, types of behaviors well, but if you ever see a dog, sometimes the they get in trouble if they do something you don't like. Um, they'll tuck their tail, they'll kind of bend down, make themselves very small. That's them displaying that submissive behavior. All right, prairie chickens are an example that we do have here in Nebraska. Um, if you watch the science of prairie chickens, you should probably know all about these guys. Um, but early spring, we have these really cool birds called prairie chickens um, out in the sand hills in western Nebraska. Um, during the spring, the males will go out to these areas called the dancing grounds, or we call them leks, or sometimes booming grounds, and they display their um, mating for the females. So they're basically showing off to show how healthy and strong and amazing they are. Um, and then the males with the best territory and and the best displays will get to mate with all the females. So um, they have these eye combs, which you can see in the picture. They look like the big fluffy eyebrows. Um, the lower, they lower their head. They raise their two tufts. They look like ears, but they're just feathers. Um, their tail is pointed slightly forward, and they will do this really cool dance. They make this booming noise, which kind of sounds like you're blowing air over a bottle. Um, they stamp their feet on the ground. They click their tails. They shake and lower their wings. They they have these orange air sacs that they extend to the side of their face. Um, basically, this huge display for these females. So then the female has the choice. She'll go through the grounds, the booming grounds, and she will pick what she would like to mate with. So um, sometimes males will clash with each other um, for territories. They'll like jump up in the air. They'll strike each other. They do have little tiny spurs um, on their feet that they will fight with them. Sometimes they get injured, um, but studies have found that the animals with the best territories, the largest eye combs and the longest legs actually have the best breeding success. So just another visual display of them, letting them know um, I'm here for the females and I'm ready to mate. Um, but they also do that auditory communication. So they're making those booming noises as well. All right, so this is a mimicry example here. So this is also a visual display. Um, there's a lot of animals that do this, but it's mimicry. So basically what's happening, there's different types of mimicry. The one I'm talking about is where a, what's called a palatable or a species that other animals can eat or a group of species. Um, they gain protection by mimicking or looking like um, resembling the defensive signal of an unpalatable species or a defended species or group. So. A great example is this um, insects. A lot of people just know you don't mess with bees. Um, a lot of people are afraid they're going to get stung, even though all bees don't sting. A lot of uh, animals also know that anything that looks like a bee, they just kind of leave it alone. Um, so insects are great at this. There's a lot of insect mimics that will mimic bees. There's flies, there's beetles, there's even some types of moths. Um, so very few predators will eat anything that even looks like a bee. Um, so they just leave it alone. So even though it's not a true bee, um, they're mimicking a bee um, so they don't get eaten and they get left alone. So um, there's a lot of other animals that do this. If you know what a um, viceroy butterfly is and a monarch butterfly. They look almost exactly the same, except for one little curvature um, vein pattern in their wing. Um, but monarchs do not taste good. They're toxic, so animals leave them alone. So there's a viceroy butterfly that looks very similar to a monarch. And animals, um, they just don't, they don't even, they're like, nope, you look like a monarch, I'm gonna leave you alone. Um, if you've ever heard of a milk snake or a king snake um, and a coral snake, they all have this very similar pattern of the yellow, the black, and the reddish orange colors. Um, animals, they just see that and they just automatically leave it alone. Um, they do not understand the differences between king snakes and coral snakes or milk snakes. They just know that you look like something that I've tried to eat before and I got sick, or you look like something where that animal ate it and died. So I'm just not going to mess with it. So um, again, another visual display. All right, so I think you understand the visual displays now. There's a lot more that I didn't cover, um, but maybe we'll cover some of them in different categories. So 
Um, the next one we're going to cover is auditory or the hearing part of the communication. Um, so this is one that a lot of people think of first, simply because this is how humans communicate with each other. It's our main way of communicating with each other. Um, so some animals will make sounds as a warning. Um, for instance, birds, if you've ever heard of like a blue jay, they will warn other blue jays, um, or sometimes they will mimic hawks, um, but they will do that to keep you out of their territory. This is their area. Uh, rattlesnakes are another great example. They make that rattling noise to warn off potential predators. Um, what are they saying to each other when they do this sometimes? A lot of animals make noises. For instance, dogs and cats will hiss and growl at each other. That's another simple way for them just to communicate that their territory, they don't like something. So there's a lot of different sounds that, you know, sounds, um, that animals will make. All right, so some animals will make alarm calls um, to let other members in their group or family know about danger. A lot of birds will do this or squirrels will do this. Um, sometimes birds, when they're trying to mate um, or press a female, they will make noises. Sometimes mothers will make specific songs with their babies or try to teach them the um, fluctuations in the call um, so they have a special call between them. Sometimes animal communication also occurs outside of our hearing range. So sometimes elephants and whales will make noises where we simply cannot hear them. Um, if you've ever watched like uh, Finding Nemo, you know that Dory will make the whale noises and you have no idea what she's saying. Same thing with the whales today. Uh, we hear these noises. We're not exactly sure what they're saying, but when we listen to them, we get a good idea of what they're trying to communicate to their other family groups or other animals out there. So auditory communications are very complex. Scientists have been studying them and there's still a lot that we do not know. Um, so there's a lot we do know, but there's a lot we do not know at all. So uh, also I wanna point out that not all the noises are going to be vocal. So some insects, for instance, they do not have vocal organs, but they can still make noise. Um, a reason I say that is because right now we're starting to hear the cicadas that are outside. Um, so these insects, they do not have vocal organs. So it's not like us that can talk. We have a voice box, we can talk and we can make noise. They can still make noise, but it's a little different. Um, so cicadas, the sounds that they have, it sounds a lot to us like an annoying buzzing noise to some people, um, but it is full of meaning when they actually break it down. Um, there was this guy, there is this person from the University of Connecticut, I believe. Um, he has been studying cicada noises for like 20 years, and he swears that he can seduce insects of either sex. So he's gotten so good at making those noises, he can fool other cicadas to thinking that he is a cicada. So um, goals. Um, male cicada will find basically when they come out of their molts, they spend a lot of their time underground as nymphs. Um, when they finally come out of their exoskeleton, a lot of the times people will see them on a branch or um, a tree or something hanging on. They're exposing themselves or coming out of that exoskeleton and then they will become an adult like this. Basically, the only idea for or the only goal for them is to um, they will eat, they will breed really quickly, and then they die. That's basically their only goal as an adult. Uh, so a male cicada then will find a spot um, for which the, he can sing. And then the interested female to hear the song will fly to meet him. Um, so the louder the male's song, the more farther it will travel, and thus the more females that he can call in. So sometimes when you hear like really loud noises, they're like almost deafening when we hear this. Um, that's just them trying to spread their sound as much as they can to get as many females to come in to mate as, as possible. Um, so when the females come in, she then is the um, receiver of that information. So she's gonna make a decision based on that information she has. So signal from females as well. Um, it will either show that she approves of the male's effort and that she would like to mate, um, or she could be like, no, thank you, go away, I'm not interested. Um, so either way, they're still making those noises. All right, squirrels. Um, a lot of us <laughs> um, have seen squirrels. We've heard squirrels in our backyards and our city parks. Um, they're actually very vocal creatures. If you've ever heard them, they make these squawk-like calls. Um, but a lot of the times, it's just making these instinctive noises um, that really only they can understand. Um, sometimes they'll twitch their tails. They'll use body language as well to kind of fluctuate um, the different types of calls. They can point danger out to each other. They use their tails almost like a pointing finger. 
Um, so they're quite vocal. They do this a lot to keep predators away or to warn other squirrels of predators in the area. Um, but squirrel communication is all one way. So each creature is saying something to the others, but they don't always necessarily need a response. Um, think of like a human, like if all of a sudden you're walking down the street and someone gasps, um, they just <gasps> all of a sudden like I don't know what you're worried about, but I know what that means. So um, it's kind of like a one-way thing for squirrels. Um, so they could make, for instance, um, different types of calls or things that they're communicating, like sounding the alarm. So a lot of times they will buzz. They kind of make the barking or moaning noises. It's very noisy and it's very intense. That is meaning that something is around that they do not like and I'm letting other squirrels know. Um, I'm looking for a mate. They make this like muck, 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 muck noise if you've ever heard them. They chase each other around the, the trees. They chase each other from tree to tree. Um, all the time, the baby squirrels, they ask for a meal and this is something they might be communicating. Um, so baby squirrels will also make this like muck, muck, muck noise as well, but it will be very uh, soft and a lot lower in um, sound to the mother instead of the mating call. And then also if they're preparing for a fight, um, they'll rattle, they'll screech. A lot of the times they'll ward off competitors, um, even different types of birds in the area. If they're in their territory, they will um, get that wrath as well. All right, um, alligators. So a lot of people, they might know this, but they are the most vocal of the crocodilians. So they're very chatty. They're very expressive when they talk. Um, even when they're still inside their eggs, um, you can hear them make these like complaining noises is what I heard that they are called. Um, but basically they're, they're talking to each other in the eggs. Um, but they also make a lot of different sounds. So like bellowing, they make a lot of mating sounds, hissing. They do this thing called a head slap, sometimes a yelp noise. Um, so basically the bellowing is for a common sound that kind of means expressing um, a specific location. So if an alligator wants another to find him, he will make this noise. Um, and it's very loud. Um, it can be heard from about 165 yards away. Um, there's also the mating sounds. Uh, they produce kind of these these purring um, sounds that are very reminiscent of like a cough. Um, the tension is very easy. It's just, I want to reproduce. Um, they also give off this infrasonic um, sound that is lower than about 20 hertz. So usually we cannot hear that, um, but other animals in the um, area can as well. And then hissing is basically like I'm frightened or I'm scared. If you've ever approached an alligator or gotten close to one, the first thing that they usually do will make this very, um, almost like a cat hissing noise. Um, and then a head slap is kind of territorial. So oftentimes they will take their giant heads, they'll close their mouth and they'll slap the water. Um, they elevate their heads and they do it really forcefully. This is them letting know, hey, this is my territory back off. Um, and then a yelping noise. So when they're stressed or when they're really anxious about something, it kind of sounds like a cry or a whining noise. Um, so they make lots of different types of noises. And being a reptile person, I just think they're really fascinating to listen to being that they're reptiles, um, but they're very, very chatty. All right, another chatty one is coyotes. So they are labeled as one of the noisiest animals in North America um, and very cool how they do their certain things and why they make these noises. Um, so they make a series of barks and yips and howls uh, to mark their territory and to let other coyotes know where they are. Uh, oftentimes when people hear coyotes, they think they're hearing a whole pack of them. Most of the times it's only about one or two individuals, but they have this very cool, um, illusion, this auditory illusion, um, this effect called the bow guest effect. And so basically they make a variety of these calls and the sound is distorted as it passes through the environment. And it sounds like, you know, two coyotes, but it's really like 40 coyotes. Um, so it's a, it's an illusion that happens as their sound passes through the environment. Um, so normally when you hear that, you're only hearing about one or two, maybe three coyotes, not like a whole pack. Um, but the group will, they'll yip in their howl. Um, usually again, it's very similar to like a wolf. They'll have that mated territorial pair of what's called the alpha coyotes and then the male howling. And then the female will kind of intersperse her yips and barks with these really short howls. Um, a lot of the times the beta coyotes will join in if they're close. Um, but it is thought to have a dual purpose kind of to promote bonding with the family as a unit, and then also serving as that territorial display as well. 
Um, so they'll howl and they'll bark separately, um, but it's always like a separate type. So it's always an indication um, if they do these kind of second types, um, they will have this always an indication of they're disturbed or they're agitated. So the higher the proportion of howls, the more agitated the coyote is. Um, some people have gotten so good at listening to certain coyotes as they study them that they can tell individuals and specific animals apart from each other simply by um, the type and the sound that they make. All right. So that was the auditory. We still have tactile and a couple others left. Um, I told you I have a lot of information today, so I hope I'm not overwhelming you, but we're gonna keep moving here and then we'll do our question answer at the end. So tactile is more like physical communication. Um, this usually tends to happen between animals of the same species. It's a way to bond, it's a way to mate. Um, the family groups are together as necessary. Um, it usually requires one animal, which is the sender, um, getting very close to the receiver, um, which sometimes can be a risk for animals to make, especially if it's like a young male going to next to a larger older male um, or a female going or a male going next to a female if she's reluctant about it um, but is the most common type of animal communication um, so prefer to stay in groups um, which limits the puts limits on the amount of tactile communication um, it's not rare among different groups of species it can happen but it's not as common uh, but also we treat it as a form of social bonding infant care grooming or even showcasing the dominance of the hierarchy of that group all right, so for instance, degus, if you've never heard of a degu, they're kind of like these rodent-like things. They're very cute. Um, they all huddle and sleep together. It offers protection, but it also maintains a close bond between those individuals. So um, it's very cute to see. Um, so this is a large kind of like rat-like rodent. Um, it lives in small parent and offspring family groups, which is they need that social bonding with each other. Um, but in their natural habitat, they live in social groups and they use a variety of those sensory modality. So group huddling, mutual grooming is very frequent. They nuzzle, they lick and groom one another. Um, they're also swapping those pheromones as well, those smells in the air. Um, so when they nuzzle and they lick each other, it attempts and it helps identify one another by special touch. Um, it, they can touch paws or the tail. Um, it also indicates a desire for Dagos to meet each other. Um, and then also the mothers, when they raise their young, um, when the newborns are born, the mother will lick them to stimulate that breathing and the blood flow, and then also it, it, to clean them and then to transfer her scent onto the babies as well. All right, birds, they're very uh, tactile, actually. So parenting birds will use this uh, as a way to feed their young. Um, a lot of birds, for instance, like blackbirds, they have a special orange dot on their face or on their beak when they have babies. Um, and what will happen is the babies have learned to peck at that area to basically stimulate the mom to regurgitate her food to give to her baby. So, um, she will also maneuver her chicks with her wings um, into a better position in the nest, especially when the weather conditions are poor. Have you ever seen like a bird extend her wings and kind of group her babies together? It's like herding the cats um, together. That's something that they are doing to um, that tactile touch as well, um, especially species like gulls and blackbirds. They're very tactile and very touchy as far as um, mom and babies. All right, dolphins are actually very um, touchy as well. I'm just gonna use touchy, um, but they snout butt each other, they head rub, they touch um, with their open mouth. These are all forms of greetings with each other. So they're very social animals. Um, they use a variety of physical cues to greet and interact with their pod, um, but they are pectoral fin. Um, they pat with their pectoral fin. Um, so there's a couple different things that that means. The first is like a greeting. It's either like a play interaction. It involves like gentle patting of the fin. Um, but there's a second one. If they do like a forceful slap to each other, it basically is like a warning. Um, the offending dolphin, basically you're in my territory. I just want to let you know, I'm being a little defensive. You need to get out of my territory. So there's two different varieties of the same type of tactile touch. Um, dolphins will also indicate this to show their dominance. Um, their teeth, as you can see here, they look fairly sharp. Um, so an irritated dolphin sometimes will teeth rake another dolphin. It's not usually enough to cause serious injury, but it's enough that it's going to be annoying and it's going to hurt. And it's just like another like, hey, um, you're in my territory. You're offending me. And you're, it's very uncomfortable for that dolphin. And it's basically showing their dominance to that other dolphin. 
All right, a lot of hooved animals will also do this. So like horses and deer, they can show their dominance by um, several ways using tactile communication. Um, but basically what they will do, they have a head shake. Sometimes they have a nod or a, um, um, a butt up against the neck. Um, they sometimes nip with their teeth um, until another animal will back down, again, showing that dominance. Um, and then hooved animals will also use their powerful hind legs to kind of kick out other animals. So if they're attempting to improve the higher um, within that group. Males will try to mate with another female. Um, that's a, usually a no-no. And so the male will come over and kind of kick that other male just to show him, hey, I'm still over here. I'm dominant. This is my area. Please do not mate with my females. I am letting you in this area. I can certainly kick you out. Um, so it's definitely exerting that dominance and showing that. Um, another one is rabbits and hares. Who would have ever thought rabbits, rabbits will show those dominance, but they definitely do. They kick a lot or they start these like boxing matches um, to determine their dominance, um, but they involve kicks to the face or sometimes their hind legs. Um, males who will win the boxing match then have the right to mate with nearby females when it is season. Um, the ones that lose get to leave. Um, and then also, both rabbits and hares can produce a very strong kick. Um, sometimes that will end the boxing match. Um, and then usually the male that gets kicked is usually injured. And that is their cue to go find something else, um, especially then females are not going to want to mate with someone that's injured. So um, it helps both of them to show and exert that dominance as well. All right, fish. Have you ever had fish that have kind of been aggressive towards each other, especially in aquarium settings? Um, so um, in aquarium fish, this is super common, um, especially when fish are kept in like really small groups. Um, there's usually what happens when there's a disproportionate number of males to females, um, but males will circle one another and then use this like flurry of quick body slams to ward off other males that are in their territory. Um, it also happens with certain types of fish, goldfish, for instance, and beta are very um, aggressive when they do that. You're only supposed to keep a couple in at one time. Betas is like one and that's it. Um, so the ideal would be two, um, one male to about two or three females. Um, this avoids potential fights because there's no other males. And usually that means the females are less likely to be harassed as well. Um, again, this is not always common in the wild, but mostly with like aquarium fish, usually there's more space for them in the wild to kind of spread out. All right, bees. This is another good example if you've ever heard of what's called the waggle dance. Um, this is really oppressive thing that's seen in honeybees. Um, so bees will use this variety of movements basically to show um, information about where food is being found for other bees. Um, so the dance explains how far away the hive is, um, what direction based on the wiggle of the animal. So, and how much food there is. So if they're intensely wiggling, there's like, there's a lot of food. If they're kind of just going back and forth. There's, there's a little, but there's some there still. Um, so this information, the worker bees can determine basically where that food is, how long it is to get there, and if it's worth using their energy to go and see um, about that food to bring it back to the hive. All right. Um, and then tactile, I'm sorry, this is actually it's supposed to be chemical. I have this tactile on here, um, but smelling. So smelling and those pheromones are very important. Um, so invertebrates most commonly will use pheromones, but there's a lot of other animals that will use that as well. Um, a lot of animals will use this as a way to attract a mate, as a means of defense, to mark their territories, or even coordinate large amount of workers, like instance bees. Um, farmers are actually using this to their advantage because they tackle pests on their crops more humanely using different types of um, pheromones instead of insecticides or herbicides or pesticides. So um, basically a pheromone is a chemical that's secreted um, by an animal to trigger a specific reaction for another animal. Oftentimes we hear about it being in urine, but it could be in lots of different forms as well. Um, so pheromones are released either into the air or sometimes they're produced via body fluids like urine, sweat, saliva. Um, so basically those certain chemicals elicit different responses depending on the concentration of those chemicals. Um, so there's different types of pheromones. There's releaser, there's primer, there's alarm, food trails, there's sex pheromones. Um, and then also unlike the sound, pheromones do not fade over time or really lose their effectiveness. So um, strong pheromones can last quite a while, whereas a sound, once it's there, it's gone. 
All right, so what are the different types of pheromones? Um, so animals usually release them in their urine, but also saliva could be one as well, or just body fluids in general. Um, so releaser pheromones, these are like immediate alterations of behavior to trigger a response from the same species. So um, it's usually generally used to attract mates um, from a distance of about one or two miles or more, um, but it elicits a very, very rapid response. Um, this one, however, is uh, degraded pretty quickly though, because it is such a need. It's a very high concentration. And then it kind of goes because it needs to happen right now. They want to trigger that response right at this moment. Um, a primer pheromone um, causes physiological changes, which last a little bit longer, but it has a delayed effect. So it's a little... Um, a little bit slower than the other one, like a releaser pheromone. Um, and then an alarm pheromone is kind of what it sounds like. It is used by an organism um, in the face of danger to either warn or alert other members of its species that something is happening. Uh, food trail, you might have heard about this with ants. They use this to kind of find their way back to their colony, um, but it's produced by the lead members of that species um, towards a food source. Um, but it also creates a territorial mark, um, especially with ants. So it's kind of like a, here's the food, but also don't go past this area. This is not ours. Um, and then sex pheromones are very similar to what they sound like as well. So they're released by an organism to attract an individual of its own species um, to encourage them for mating. So um, we'll talk a little bit about these as well. All right, so bees. Um, I told you we're going to talk about bees a lot today. So bees also use pheromones to coordinate basically their everyday life. Um, the queen will control the behavior of her colony by releasing certain pheromones on the nest. Um, firstly, her pheromones keep the order of the colony um, within the nest or the hive. And then secondly, the queen's pheromones will prevent other uh, bees from laying eggs because that is her sole job. Only the queen can fertilize the eggs because she's the one that stores the sperm. Um, without the queen's pheromones, all the worker bees would just start laying eggs and it would be chaos. Um, so a new queen, when she comes in, um, can mate with as many as about 20 different types of drones, um, collects their sperm, fertilizes the eggs and throughout her lifetime, and then her pheromones will draw males to her to inform her that she's ready and she's receptive to mating. So um, it tells a lot of information for that queen, and it also helps keep the peace in the colony. All right, if any of you have animals and you feed them mealworms, um, when you see the worms, you usually feed those worms, but if you let them change in metamorphosis, this is what they turn out to be, mealworm burnt beetles. Um, so female mealworm beetles, they release these sex pheromones to attract male beetles to let them know that they're ready to mate. Um, however, once the first male finds and mates with her, he covers her in her pheromone so that other, other males do not want to mate with her because um, she's already taken. So this tactic basically ensures that the first male can pass on his DNA to the female. If he does not use his pheromone or does not use enough of it, um, other males can mate with her as well. All right, pigs and boars will do this a lot too. They have a ton of olfactory receptors, um, basically using pheromones to let them know their reproductive state or they're ready to go. So um, they can detect scents very far away and in very low concentrations, even less than, or even more than humans. Um, but the male will produce a sex pheromone in his saliva, um, which is believed to trigger the female to adopt a more receptive body position so the male can mate with her. So um, they will track and then also to help mate and to ensure his DNA then is passed on. All right, monarch butterflies will do this as well. Um, they're probably like the most recognizable butterfly that's out there, um, but the bright orange coloration, the light, large kind of white spots around the edge of the, the wings, um, basically they makes them easy to spot, um, but it makes them easy targets for predators. However, they eat, the caterpillars will eat the milkweed and they taste toxic. So the plants will emit pheromones that have a very bitter taste. So when predators try to eat a monarch butterfly, they spit it out because the taste is just like overpowering. It's disgusting. Um, so again, animals have learned over time that anything that looks like this, they just leave it alone. Uh, the caterpillars um, also complete their growth and then the chances of them becoming um, a butterfly then um, also helps the milkweed. So it's that symbiotic relationship. 
All right, moths, um, especially these guys with a really fuzzy antenna. Um, during the larval stage, females will feed on plants that contain certain types of alkaloids that are poisonous or they taste bad to other animals. So um, this is kind of the same thing as with those butterflies. Um, some species will do that. And then also females will release the pheromone so the males can come find them to uh, mate with them. Um, so male moths have these super um, fuzzy antennas to have more surface area to pick up those pheromones. So um, it depends on the species, but they say that a couple miles away, a male moth can smell a female and go find her. Um, this also helps with um, interbreeding with other species. So each species will have a very specific smell um, that males will need to go find so they know how to find each other. All right, and then last one, um, dogs and cats. So if you have a dog or cat, they've come up to you and they like rub on you and you're like, oh, they love me. Well, yes, they do, but they're also marking you. So they're marking their pheromone on you to mark your territory, um, especially males. They'll travel like the edges of their territory. Um, if you have a cat that is not um, spayed or neutered, especially a male, so neutering, um, it will mark its territory. So they will spray their urine on a lot of different things. Sometimes that's in your house. They're just letting other male cats know that that's their area. So they can't help it. They're doing their best. Um, but male, um, like wild animals, so mountain lions, tigers, they spread their pheromones onto tree trunks, logs, rocks, basically at the edge of their territory. Um, it's really interesting if you ever go to like the Omaha Zoo or the Lincoln Children's Zoo, um, none of the tigers are neutered. Uh, the ones at least in Omaha, or sorry, in Lincoln are not. And if you watch closely when they go around the edge of their territory, they will spray their urine on everything. Um, so even the two males at the Lincoln Children's Zoo, they're both brothers. They are still communicating to each other where their specific territory is. Even though they're stuck in that container together, they still have their own area. And then also when you take your male dog for a walk, you probably notice that he urinates on everything that other dogs have. Um, again, that is just him saying, okay, this is my territory. They're covering up and making sure that other dogs that come by do not smell um, theirs, but instead they smell theirs. So it's basically informing other dogs that they are in that area. So when female dogs urinate, um, males can detect then whether the female is in estrus and ready to mate or not. So a lot of different ways that animals will communicate with each other. I hope that you have a little different um, view now when you see animals and you watch their behavior in the wild. What are they communicating to each other? Are they doing it tactically? Um, so touching, are they doing it with pheromones? Are they doing it with sound? Um, are they displaying something? So there's a lot of different ways that animals communicate. And also remember, they don't just do one way. Um, so bees, we talked about, they use pheromones, they use sound, they use the waggle dance. So there's lots of different ways that animals will communicate with each other. All right, so that was communication. Um, we have one more in our Science of Summer series. It's next Thursday, same time, 3 to 4 p.m. We're going to be ending on cloud nine, literally clouds. We're going to be talking about clouds next week and the different types of clouds, how they form, um, that kind of stuff. So um, next week, 3 to 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. Um, if you really liked this, we do record all of our programs and we will put them on our Nebraska Game and Parks Education YouTube channel. We also have a uh, wildlife education Facebook page. We have something called our wildlife education Instagram. So we have a lot of different things. And then also our website, our main um, website off of our Outdoor Nebraska um, Game and Parks main site as well. All right. And then thanks everyone. Um, I'll be looking at the questions now, but make sure you join us next week for cloud. And I'm going to stop sharing here and go back and check Interesting. Thank you. Um, does cut or do coyotes ever sound like laughter? There's a lot of people that do believe that. Um, there's a lot of stories about them being known as tricksters um, or very like curious animals, kind of like fooling animals. Um, so it kind of just that would kind of be a subjective thing. But yes, I absolutely do. When you hear a bunch of coyotes, it sounds like they're yipping and barking. It kind of does sound like laughter. Absolutely. So, all right. Well, I hope everyone learned a ton of information. Um, yes. Yep. Just remember, I know a couple of people have been saying they've been having some issues with Facebook. Facebook is weird. Um, it says that it usually starts at, 
it's supposed to start at three central time, but sometimes it says four central time. I will always let you know that our science of programs is always, always, always 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. So go off of what the email says, not of what social media says. I'm not sure why Facebook does that, but I know a couple of people have emailed me that they've gotten the times wrong. So um, it was, someone said it started at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Totally not right. Nope. Go off of um, my email that I send you and then also when you register through Zoom. Um, but Science Of will always start at 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. Um, so just to let everybody know, so that would be 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Yes. Um, so if you have any other questions, just go ahead and email me. But we will see you next week at 3 p.m. Central Time for clouds. So thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great rest of your weekend and we'll see you next week. Thank you.